can I pause? Okay, so today we're going to talk about the deep time of Earth history, which is any time that deals with years in millions to billions of years, which is generally unusual for humans to talk about because they usually think of time in the course of months to years, which is on geological time almost non-existent. So when we talk about long periods of time at geological scales, we usually use this term deep time to understand that a little bit better. And we need to talk about this because generally the animals we're going to be talking about in the future are going to be in deep time. So they're going to be millions of years uh, old when we talk about them. So a couple of terms before we get started. Strata are layers of rock, and those are what you saw in the prior picture where rocks are laid down on top of each other in, in bands. There's also the study of strata, which is stratigraphy, um, and these are often used to identify layers. So within stratigraphy, we identify time in three major ways. We use geochronology, which is earth time, which we use isotopes to do. Uh, we use lithostratigraphy, which is the rock time, and we're going to use that by physically knowing where layers are relative to another layer. And we use biostratigraphy, which is that we're going to look at fossils, through, and they're going to give us an indication of how old a rock is relative to another. So geochronology always refers to, and this is probably true with most of the other stuff we're going to deal with, we refer to times as before present. And for most time, it's irrelevant that the present time is ticking forward because we're dealing with millions to billions of years, and therefore years or months advancing have almost no bearing on our relative depth within the time. So you might see it abbreviated as YPB or YA. Uh, these would mean years before present or uh, years ago. Uh, and you may see units added to the front of them, just as you would with a metric system that would refer to millions or potentially billions of years. So how old is the Earth actually? Well, it sort of depends on what you're talking about. Are you talking about when the Earth actually appeared? Uh, are you talking about the surface of the Earth as you see it today? Or are you talking about uh, when animals first appeared? Or are you talking about when the Earth was first cool enough to support life? Well, in any case, uh, the surface of the Earth was a relatively hot place with lots of magma and therefore not much solid rock for long periods of time, and we probably don't have any life on it for a number of years, and that probably until about four billion years ago, maybe roughly, is when the first life appeared. And we're going to talk about this uh, in the future, but for the moment, know that uh, this is a fairly good indication of what early Earth looked like. Rocks that are melting frequently, nothing on the land surface, uh, and rivers of molten lava or oceans of molten lava instead of water. And in the near distance is a, a giant moon. So if we wanted to go about aging those rocks, uh, what we'd actually look at is we'd look for uh, radioactive decay. And this will give us an actual indication of how old the rock is, because if we know the amount of elements uh, that are present and we know that they've decayed from one to another, we can estimate exactly how old that rock would be. And keeping in mind that elements uh, are broken up by the number of protons, that gives you different species of elements. And then within uh, a species of element, you can have different isotopes, which are the number of neutrons located within that uh, nucleus. And in this case, these are all carbon. Uh, the carbon-12, 13, and 14. Carbon-12 and 13 are, of course, both stable. Carbon-14 is actually, as it says here, radioactive, and it does break down with time. And if you know the amount of carbon-14 you have initially in some uh, thing, and then you go and measure it uh, in it, that object uh, many years later, you can actually estimate the number of years uh, that's taken for that object to get there. Here's just an example of a broader picture of carbon-13, or carbon uh, isotopes. Now I've shown you carbon-12, 13, and 14, which sit in the middle of these. The black squares are the ones that are stable. Everything else is unstable. And then you can also see the half-life uh, listed above. So for most of these elements, uh, there's only two that are stable. Most of these elements, the half-life, which is the amount of time it takes half of that, uh, that uh, isotope, or that, yes, half of the time it takes for half of that material to decay, uh, or the amount of time it takes half of that material to decay, what you end up with is uh, on the order of seconds to maybe even milliseconds. You can see C20, which is incredibly uh, rapid decay rate of only 14 milliseconds. So how do action atoms actually go about dying? Well, their nuclei may split, as in here with uranium. We've got a neutron coming in and slamming into this U-235, which makes it unstable, and it splits into two different species of 
m. Um, in the case of carbon-14, what is actually happening is we have uh, some form of cosmic radiation, which is bombarding a nitrogen-14 nucleus with a neutron. When that happens, it spits out one of the protons, uh, and that forms carbon-14, and if that carbon-14 gets incorporated into an, an animal uh, or a plant, then it may eventually uh, uh, decay again into a nitrogen-14 atom by spitting out a proton. And this is how you might go about measuring C14. C14 is actually very difficult to find, and as a result, uh, you need incredibly complex instruments to go about measuring it, because you need to have very, very fine control. And this is just C14. C14 is useful because its half-life is on the order of thousands of years of measuring things that are on the order of thousands of years. Uh, but we'd need another isotope if we're interested in looking at things older than that. And we're going to have to scale that isotope depending on how long ago the item is that, we've, that the item was buried that we're dealing with. So we need an isotope that decays uh, rapidly enough to measure the time accurately. Uh, so we need something that decays on the order for us millions of years, probably hundreds of millions of years. And we don't want anything that decays at a very long time period, like this one, for instance, rubidium and strontium, which has a half-life of 48.8 billion years. So to get from 87, to get half of all 87 rubidium that was formed at the beginning of the uh, uh, universe, we would have to wait to 87 strontium, we would have to wait 48.8 billion years. Now that's a relatively long period of time, uh, even by deep time standards, and that actually has not yet occurred because that is such a long period of time, the universe hasn't been around that long. So in that case, rubidium and strontium would be useless. It would be very similar to trying to measure uh, a 50-meter dash um, with a uh, uh, sundial. It would just be completely inappropriate and wouldn't provide you any information about the speed of that event. But there are lots of other elements here, and I'm just showing you a periodic table. There's lots of other things that we could we could pick to do that. Carbon is a carbon 14 is a good one for relatively young ages. Rubidium might be a better one if we're dealing with extremely old ages or if we're dealing with sort of rocks that formed uh, initially. Uh, even then it would be a relatively inexact, but some of these other ones are still useful within here, and if you were to study uh, elemental decay, you would go and find elements that would provide you with that, the clock that you would need. For instance, uh, we use cesium to provide very, very accurate estimates of time at very short time scales, uh, nanoseconds and that kind of thing. That's what makes up the atomic clock. The other thing we might consider is that we might use lithostratigraphy to define time, so then an item's placement relative to the layer that it's in. And this can be very, very useful if we know the ages of different layers. You know, for instance, that um, a layer formed in the Triassic and another formed in the Jurassic, then they are around your fossil, then your fossil must have been formed between the Triassic and the Jurassic at some point. Now, it's a fairly broad time, but you can get this down to very, very small periods of time, less than a million years in some cases. That provides what's called a relative dating, which is a dating of a rock relative to another rock. So you may not know exactly the age, but you know what the rock above and below it is. And you would then estimate the range of years that that thing uh, could actually be estimated. This is really nice if you have rocks that are very good um, time intervals. It's not so useful if the rocks are discontinuous. So you have, let's say, lots of rocks from the Triassic and then no rocks. Uh, and then lots of rocks from the Cretaceous. Anything that fell between those two rocks or near the edge of those rocks would be relatively difficult to date. The other thing we might use is biostratigraphy. So we may look at the fossil record actually within the rocks that we're measuring to find out the rough ages. So for instance, here these are uh, plankton that have been aged but prior, and if we went into a new rock and found these five species of plankton, we would say, ah, well, if these five species of plankton are present, the rock has to be between this age. In addition to that, we might say, okay, but we actually didn't find this plankton on the far right, so that means that they're actually between this age. And if you're really lucky, what you have is instead you maybe only have these three, uh, into these three species, and when you do that, you have these incredibly small intervals, right, over which your fossil must have appeared, because that's the only interval during which all three of these species are known to coexist, with no other species present. And so that brings us to, to what is the standard view of the different periods, epochs, and time of Earth. And so most of this class is going to deal with the Mesozoic. 
uh, and that will study the Triassic, the Jurassic, and the Cretaceous. Those are what we call, again, these are sort of the age of dinosaurs to some degree, uh, but do keep in mind, of course, that the Cenozoic includes all of the birds, which are, of course, all derived dinosaurs. Uh, we just call the study of them in the Cenozoic ornithology, whereas in the Mesozoic we call it the study of dinosaurs, dinosaurology. Prior to the Mesozoic, there are no dinosaurs, so we don't have to worry about changing the name of the field again. And then anything prior to the Precambrian, there's basically nothing larger than maybe something the size of a small nematode, and we're going to talk about that again in the future, but for the moment, uh, really the only pieces that have vertebrate life, as far as we're concerned, are the Paleozoic, the Mesozoic, and the Cenozoic. And you should be comfortable with the terms Paleozoic, Mesozoic, and Cenozoic and very comfortable with the terms Triassic, Jurassic, and Cretaceous as we proceed through the course. So how do we actually form rocks? Well, rocks are formed through plate tectonics, and that's because uh, the Earth is not a solid piece of rock. So plate tectonics is the situation in which uh, the surface of the Earth is actually floating on a sea of lava. And the sea of lava is actually a conveyor belt, and we'll see that in the next slide. But the surface of the Earth has two types of plates. We have what's called continental crust, and we have oceanic crust. Continental crust is less dense. It formed initially as the Earth was cooling. And oceanic crust is the denser uh, material that is still forming and spreading. And occasionally continental crust is also growing. Uh, it is being produced as uh, other portions of melted very light uh, material me it melts and comes to the surface and then is expelled in volcanoes. But in any case, uh, the, the crusts uh, on the Earth have very important impact in that the surface of the Earth is under constant change. You don't have a single surface of the Earth. If you look at the Earth through time, it changes appearance. So how does that actually go about happening? Well, like I said, there's a sea of lava, and then there's a, there's a series of uh, cores in the center of the Earth, but we can largely ignore the cores for the purposes of this class. We're not going to need to talk about them. But the lava that's around the core uh, heats near the center of the core. It becomes less dense as a result, as, it, as fluids become when they're heated. That less dense fluid tends to rise. It rises up towards the surface of the Earth. There it starts to give off some of its heat, um, and it circulates as it cools. And then it becomes denser because of the cooling. It sinks back into the core where it heats again. On the top of that little conveyor belt, there's these very thin, and here it's, it's overly exaggerated, the thickness, a uh, very thin layer of cool material. So this is where we reside, right? We reside right on top of that. And those, those pieces, as that magma underneath them is moving, that, that uh, molten lava is moving, pull those uh, sheets of material around on the surface of the Earth. So, Again, I'm not going to show you the video because it forces me to break out of the uh, presentation here and I can't save the information as I go. But if you go on and you look up surface of the Earth through time, you can actually see the surface of the Earth change through time as a result of that. So here's a good example of a one picture of the surface of the Earth at a different period of time. And it's very, very different from the Earth we have today. Although you can certainly recognize some things here. Uh, down in the lower portion, uh, this large landmass that's forming, that almost is split by a sea, but you can see that there's a continental margin that's breaking, is South America and Africa, and Antarctica, and Australia, and India, and you can see some of these landmasses uh, within that. And then north of that is the pieces that are North America and Asia. So what about climate? So are the climate been the same? The surface, if we're looking at the surface, and it has been absolutely not. The climate has changed through time. Relatively speaking, the Earth right now is very cool uh, compared to what it was a few million, uh, let's say tens of, to hundreds of million years ago. Does that mean that climate change is not a threat? No, that just means that uh, the coolness of the Earth is a little bit, the average temperature is different. In fact, climate change is more of a threat as a result of that because a lot of animals and plants are adapted to those cooler climates now. So why do we have changes in temperature? Well, it actually has to go along with these changing surface appearances, and part of that is the way that heat is stored within the Earth. Heat capacity is how much energy is required to change the temperature of an object, and water has an extremely high, extremely high heat capacity, uh, especially uh, for a liquid, but it has an extremely high heat capacity. It's part of the reason it's frequently used as a coolant, and it's part of the reason uh, it's used as a lubricant, and it's part of the reason uh, that your body uses so much water. 
So if you have lots of water on the surface of the Earth relative to everything else, you have very moderate temperatures on the Earth. They can be hot, they can be cool, but they're usually very moderate in the sense that they're the, the, the extremes are more limited. If on the other hand you have lots of continental crust, which has a very low heat capacity relative to water, which is when lots of land is exposed and you have very, very high um, uh, variations in temperature. You'll have more extreme values and the values will range from lower to higher. So when we have these high period, these high exposures of continental plates, we get these extreme temperatures. And when we have lots of continental plate that's separated from the ocean, we have uh, very, very, very high uh, temperatures inland. Uh, and you can imagine those places being something like uh, Death Valley, right? That that's extent over large periods of the places on the Earth. When we have more water exposed and the continents are well separated and there's not much inland, then the temperature is almost everywhere are very, very similar and these tend to be very moderate temperatures in those cases. So if you think about something like a uh, ginkgo tree, and ginkgo trees are a very, very old group, they've been around for a long time, uh, and how they might have evolved, well, ginkgo trees are deciduous, which means they lose their leaves in the fall, and they lose their leaves when productivity begins to fall off, and so the tree would have to pay to keep all these leaves around when they're not producing any energy, and they actually be consuming more energy than they're producing. So ginkgo trees clearly evolved in, a, in an environment in which there are changes between seasons, right? So there's a, a seasonal shift between one period to another. And that's not unusual. We've seen that evolve multiple times in trees. So what were the Mesozoic climates like? Well, if you look at the Triassic, which is the oldest and, and when the, uh, the first period of the Mesozoic, you have probably fairly hot, um, very, very seasonal weather, and there's probably as a result of that a lot of droughts and floods. There's large portions of the continents which are pushed together, uh, and seas uh, are not as prevalent in that case. The Jurassic that by the, that period, uh, so this is a younger period, right, so this is after the Triassic, it appears that all the ice on the surface of the Earth has been melted, so ice on the surface of the Earth is not always present as far as we can tell. It appears to disappear and reappear, and there's some indication even that in the past that the surface of the Earth has been completely covered by ice. But in any case, uh, by the Jurassic there appears to be uh, ice uh, uh, almost nowhere or nowhere on the surface of the Earth, and the seasonability of the climate appears more stable. There's lots of equatorial uh, oceans, and the continents are starting to move apart, allowing those uh, those uh, inland uh, waters to, to moderate those climates. In the Cretaceous, uh, it stays relatively warm, especially at the beginning. It appears to be relatively stable, again, similar to the Triassic, but that begins to change. So by the end of it, we have a warming trend, and that leads to what appears to be instability in the climate with more extreme values uh, going from hot to cold near the end of the Cretaceous, which is one of the components that we're going to talk about when we get to the extinction event at the Cretaceous tertiary boundary. Okay, and so if you're taking this course, then you will have uh, also an understanding that the book associated with this has a very good section on this and has lots of background material on this topic. So I'm not going to go much further into it, and I've purposely left out some materials. If you're watching this course without having read the book, you should feel free to, to purchase or rent the book or uh, request the book through a library loan uh, and read this section. It's a very good, very basic introduction to the topic of geology and the changing Earth's surface through time.